It is now my pleasure to um, get the ball rolling for our second plenary session today entitled um, Smart Global Approaches. So I will invite uh, the panel to join me on stage. But before I do, I did just want to remind everyone that we do have French and English translation uh, headsets available uh, at the reception desk if you uh, need them. So I would like to invite on stage the moderator for today's session, uh, David Agnew, the president of Seneca College. Barbara Schneeman, the Higher Education Coordinator for the United States Agency for International Development. Stephen Davis, the Executive Director of Academics Without Borders. And Thierry Zomahoun, President and CEO of the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining us this afternoon. I hope uh, lunch was uh, successful, and I know that uh, I was involved in one, but there are a couple of uh, uh, interesting uh, lunch and learns for those who uh, wanted a little uh, intellectual sustenance along with their nutrition. Um, we're uh, assembled uh, this afternoon for this plenary session, an exciting uh, topic, and uh, not, that, uh, not that there hasn't been uh, around uh, practical issues, but this is uh, speaking very, very directly about successful approaches uh, in this um, in important topic. So I'm going to turn it right over to our uh, first presenter, um, Steve Davis, and uh, we'll save questions till uh, after. I'm expecting a, a rich discussion, um, but we'll, uh, we'll first hear from our three presenters. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And excuse me, I'm an old professor, and I'm used to standing up. So I'm going to stand up, and I'm going to take this because I have a slideshow. Uh, can you see the slide? That's, that's the beginning slide. Uh, what do I do here? The green button. The green button. So I have a green button here. So I might even walk around. That's what I did when I was lecturing. So, so my name is Stephen Davis. I'm the executive director and founder of Academics Without Borders. Now, we're an organization that is located in Montreal. We were founded in 2007. Uh, we're a charity. We have charity status in Canada and in the United States. We've done uh, 75 projects since 2009 when we sent out our first volunteer. We have uh, sent out about 100 volunteers. The interesting thing, which isn't up there, we have a roster of 200 people who are willing to go tomorrow. Uh, we don't have projects uh, yet for them. Supposed to work? There we go. So what do we do? Uh, it's quite simple what our mission is. What we do is to help developing countries, especially poor developing countries, build capacity in higher education. Why do we do that? It's to enable the developing world to train the experts and professionals and do the research they need for their development. How do we do that? The model we have is to send out volunteers to train the trainers. So we don't send out visiting professors who are going to lecture students. As you'll see, that's not sustainable. It's a good thing to do, but if you train the trainers, then they can educate the students on and on and on. Now, let's look at the cascading effect of this. That person in red there is one of our volunteers. He or she would train the teachers or the staff or the administrators, because we work in all the areas in which universities work. And those people, in turn, would teach the students, or work with their staff, or work with others at the institution, and in turn, the services and education would be provided to those people in blue. We work in a range of countries, mostly in Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. Now, here's a very important uh, take-home for you, uh, how to get buy-in. <clears throat> The projects originate from the institutions in the developing world. We've never advertised. People find out about us by word of mouth or through our internet. 
and they write an email message and said, we need help in this area or this area, and then we get them to fill out a project proposal where they themselves say what they want done. And it's quite detailed. They also talk about the outcomes, activities, and so forth and so on. So right at the very beginning, the projects are theirs. Another element for the buy-in is that we ask the institutions to participate in the financing of the project. We send volunteers, it costs money to send them. So we ask the institutions to provide housing, a stipend, and maybe even airfare if they're able to do so. We don't refuse an institution if it says we can't provide any of this. But we say, look, this is your project. So you should be contributing financially to the project. And almost all of our institutions contribute some amounts to finance them. Some even contribute a great deal. Now, we don't bring academics, this is kind of controversial, from the developing world to the developed world to study. Uh, and the reason for that is that we're just afraid of the brain drain. We're afraid that if they come out and they get their medical degree from the university in Ottawa or in Montreal in Toronto, then they might stay. Now, that's up to them. That's an individual decision. I would never criticize anybody who stayed. But it's bad for the home country. It's better if they're educated in the home country doesn't mean that they won't leave. That's up to them. That's an individual choice. But increases the chances that they will stay in the home country and contribute to the development of their own country. Now, <clears throat> going back to the, the costs here about the contributions, because they have the contributions from the, uh, the uh, institutions with which we work, our projects cost very little. So we can do a project that costs if the institution provides airfare, a lo local stipend, housing for $1,500, where we provide vaccinations, we provide medication, we provide insurance, et cetera, for our volunteers. The most expensive project we ever had was a 9,000. That's to spend, send a volunteer for a year for a project we had in Indonesia. Now, our operation costs, which are actually included in that, are very low because we have a virtual office. We have no bricks and mortar. Uh, a lot of the people who work for us are not paid. I'm not paid, so I'm doing this for free, folks. Uh, and uh, we have some people who are paid, and they're very generous with their time. Uh, almost all of them contribute part of their time uh, pro bono. Our volunteers who go off into the field, and I hope that some of you will sign up to be volunteers. You can find that on our website. They're not paid. All we do is cover their expenses. We don't transfer funds or equipment to the developing world because we want to keep our mission focused. And again, that's extremely important for us to keep the mission focused. We transfer expertise. There are other organizations that do funding to institutions in the development world or provide equipment. And this is key. The institutions and the people there are the agents of change. Our volunteers go from two weeks to to a month, to a year, depending upon the project. But they leave. So if those projects are going to be sustainable, the institutions themselves have to sustain them. And that's important. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. And they're wasting their time. And I don't think that's a very good thing. So we're there to assist. We're there to help our colleagues in the developing world. And they are our colleagues. Now, we work in any area in which a university is active. So it's not just teaching, it's not just research. We also work in back office operations. And I have a former volunteer here who did just that, did a wonderful project in Rwanda upgrading the registrar's office. Uh, her name is Gudrun Curry. Is, is Gudrun? There she is, right there. Take a look at her. She did a terrific job in upgrading the registrar's office at the university, at National University of Rwanda. Now, the problem has been for the last number of years, I, I think Paul Davidson said for the last 15 years or something like that, at least in Canada, not in other places, uh, <clears throat> the higher education has been neglected. 
uh, money has gone into other areas. It's gone basically into primary education and uh, health services. I think there's a problem there. There's a kind of disconnect, a very important disconnect. Good education and basic health can't be provided unless you have well-trained teachers and administrators and well-trained health workers. And where are those people educated? Well, it's quite obvious. It's the institutions of higher education that train those people. So if you don't have good training for the teachers, even if you get the kids in primary school, they're not going to get a good education. If you have clinics in rural areas and you don't have the doctors to staff them or the nurses to staff them or the technicians to staff them, you're not going to have health care. And they have to be trained at institutions of higher education. Now, I want to use a case study for you to show you how we operate. <coughs> I want to take Ethiopia, which is one of the poorest countries in the world. Now, they have uh, close to 100 million people, and uh, they have 13 cardiologists for the whole country. 13. That's it. That's all. And they have no standardized residency program. Uh, Dr. Kabida approached us and said, look, I want to have your help in upgrading the teaching of cardiology to begin with, and then to put in a residency program in cardiology. The first step was to send off two Canadian professors of cardiology from the University of Alberta. They're, abs they're just terrific. Uh, they went off and they came back and said, yes, we think it's possible to do this, and they gave us the statistics that I just mentioned. Now, here's a, a little thing about the costs of this. No, by the way, Ethiopia is, a, I say, a poor country. Kelly University is a poor university. But they want this. So here's the buy-in. They're willing to provide housing, meals, in-country transportation, we get our volunteers flown into Addis, they pay for the transportation from Addis up to McKelly, and then in McKelly they do local transportation. We ended up paying 5,600 Canadian uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> for those two volunteers. By the way, some of you are from the States, it's a lot less in U.S. funds, as you can see, given the disastrous exchange rate that we now have. I hope the price of oil goes up. <laughs> So, what are we going to do? Well, we've got a plan now for upgrading cardiology. Uh, we're going to send a teams of volunteers, a cardiologist and then a technician nurse, depending upon uh, the resources we have and the availability of people. We're going to do that two or three times a year, depends upon the availability of the volunteers. And also at the other end, when the people there can make most use of the people who are going to come. We're going to do that beginning over the course of three years to upgrade the teaching of cardiology. And our hope, the outcomes would be improved teaching of cardiology to the medical students. And we hope, of course, the end result, the, the impact, is better treatment for people who have cardiovascular diseases. Now, we happen to have two volunteers, and it's just appropriate, they're there now. As we talk, they are in <coughs> McKelly University, and we have a cardiologist, and we have a technician who uh, is there to begin this process. So we're going to continue this for some years, and part of this is to draft a plan for a residency program. The next is to find partners with whom we can work, and most importantly, to raise funds. If we're sending out teams of three people, <coughs> three times a year, given the cost breakdown I gave you, it's going to cost us $15,000 a year, which for us is a lot of money. We are, uh, I think, terribly underfunded. By the way, if you'd like to donate to us, you can donate online uh, on our website. And we're going to be there as long as it takes. And another thing I want you to hear from me is this is not two or three years, it's not five years, we estimate to put in a residency program, it's going to take us 10 years, given the kind of way uh, that we're uh, doing this. Now, I want to sum up our approach, because this is what this plenary is about, the particular approaches that we have. So let's take the first thing. The project proposals originate from the institutions. They have stakeholders there who want the projects, and that's important. There are people in place who say, yes, we want to have this done. 
They determine the project's activities, goals, and desired outcomes. They contribute in kind and financially. They make the final decision about the volunteers. So if I get a number of you people who are now going to go off to Ethiopia to assist with this, I would take your CVs, your letters of reference. I would call your referees, by the way, because you know what letters of reference are these days. You can never trust them. You get people on the telephone. You say, well, is there anything you'd like to tell me about this person? Sometimes I get people who say, yes, I wouldn't put this in the letter, but here's something you should know about. So we send this information, if we have a number of people who are qualified, to the institution. The institution then makes the final selection. So the volunteer is their volunteer. Again, that's the buy-in kind of issue here. The point is that they sustain the project after our volunteers leave. Uh, otherwise, if you go in there with big boots on, you say, look, we think you should do this and this and this and this, uh, it's not going to be sustained. They are the agents of change. So what do we do? Well, we assist if they ask for help in drafting the proposal. Uh, we, of course, have to determine whether we can do it, whether we have the volunteers that could do this kind of thing, whether we can find the funding for it. Uh, we recruit the volunteers, and we have representatives in 65 Canadian universities who help with this. Plus, we have partners uh, who have contacts in various areas who can help us with the recruiting. We prepare the volunteers for their postings. We have a duty of care to our volunteers, so we have to make sure as much as we can that they're going to be safe and secure. So we prepare them with orientation material, make sure that they have insurance, buy insurance for them if they don't. Uh, then we pay the expenses of the volunteers uh, if the institution is not covering uh, X, Y, and Z. We, we pick up those expenses. At the end of the project, we have forms for our volunteers to, to fill out to do a report on what they did and the outcomes, not impact, but outcomes of the projects. That we share, of course, with our partners in the developing world, and we use that information to help us design better and better projects. Now, we haven't done this in a systematic way, but we are planning to do this more systematically to do an evaluation after uh, a number of years, say a year or two years, to see if the project is then being sustained. So I want to thank you very much for listening. Uh, that's the kind of way that we operate, and I'd like to hear how other people are operating and what they're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There you go. So we now turn to our second uh, presenter, Dr. Terry Zumahun, who is the President and CEO of the African Institute for Mathematical Science. Thank uh, you. Thank you. <laughs> Not doctor yet? <laughs> Soon. Thank you. Honorary. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I think uh, uh, I've listened to Steve. You've been very passionate about what you're doing. I want to say thank you to the organizers of this conference. I don't know how the idea of smart uh, development care come about. Uh, I, would learn, I would love to learn about that. It's, uh, it's a great idea. And the, the organization I represent here, the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, is one of those products of smart development thinking. So we launched AIMS 14 years ago. But before I go on to, uh, to share with you how we are helping advance the SDGs through STEM education and research and a global scientific platform. Allow me to say that, um, uh, like my other colleagues, that these conferences came in at the right time because uh, 50, 20 years ago, if you would have asked people to come to a conference like this uh, with a focus on higher education, uh, I guess it would have been unimaginable because the focus was not on higher education. So uh, now there's a paradigm shift, and we're happy that this is, the momentum is increasing. Yesterday, listening to the, the right honorable governor general, when he introduced AIMS, uh, uh, he introduced AIMS so well that at some point I said to myself, well, what do I have left to say about AIMS? <laughs> so uh, I will chip in the framework that he provided yesterday. AIMS is 
currently Africa's biggest network of centers of excellence in mathematical sciences. Uh, we've grown to become the biggest with the support of the government of Canada and the support of some African governments. Actually, I like to make crack jokes when I tell some of my fellow Africans that Canada helped AIMS to become Pan-African. So uh, we were able to grow, to span six countries today across the, country, the continent, uh, because we first got the buy-in from the Canadian government and then with the support of the African government. So our vision directly links the transformation of Africa with technical advances, with innovative postgraduate training in STEM education and, and research, and to major discoveries. That's what we want to do. We're doing this because we think and we believe that Africa will not transform if we don't invest in STEM education and research. Basic education is great. Microfinance is excellent. I was in that sector, but they never transform a nation, let alone a continent. So why is science so important, or STEM education and research so important to, to us at Ames? Number one, colonial legacy. Until late the, the late 50s, not many Africans under colonial era were allowed to have access to science. That's a fact. And then post-colonial era, we got a new political leadership across the continent. Uh, I think at some point, they didn't take, uh, and this is not to point fingers to our political leaders across the continent, but they didn't take adequate measures to reverse the trend to the point where you see our university sometimes, people graduating from high school, you see 80% of them going into humanities, sociology, and the philosophy, nothing wrong about it. But when you are on a continent where you desperately need to build capacity in STEM education, in technical skills, you need to do something about reversing that trend. Second, why is science so important? Uh, because the continent is still suffering from one thing, weak research infrastructure. And third, poor governance and leadership. This is the reason why we think uh, we need to be deliberate about um, um, addressing the challenges that the continent is facing by focusing on STEM. Plus, we have young, many young Africans, many young scientists across the continent who today are making extraordinary uh, things happen. Our, one of our researchers at Ames has <clears throat> solved a few months ago an immunological puzzle, which has been in existence for 70 years. He works for Ames South Africa and Ames uh, Ghana, and he is a researcher, one of those chairs that we are developing with our key partners here, IDRC, and some of our Canadian universities. Thank you, Jean Lebel and Nasser, for your support. So the puzzles that his research helps um, uh, solved was that he answered the question to why a person who is, has suffered um, from influenza, for instance, at the first time, is more prone to suffer from it again. So the outcome of research is going to revolutionize the vaccine design. So this young Cameroonian is sitting between Cape Town and Cape Coast, and it's, it's an example of how science can help tackle those issues. This all relate to why science is so important for AIMS, because quite often I get asked questions when I'm traveling across the continent as to why are you guys focusing so much on science and more particularly on mathematical sciences? And I say, well, the reason why we're doing that is that science can set Africa free. Science will reverse the trend. Education and research will reverse the trend we've been in for decades, if not centuries. Um, before I tell you of how AIMS 
is concretely approaching, uh, advancing the, the SDGs. Let me set the stage by providing you with a couple of stats. We hear many people say how poor the contribution, weak the contribution of Africa in terms of research global output is. And those are some statistics, what you're seeing there. Only 25% of young Africans go into STEM education and research. And the Africa's share of the global research production is still less than 1%. But a big but. This 1% hides a reality that over the past decade, Africa's research output has more than tripled, which is it's growing faster than any region on Earth. But it's still, there's a challenge, and the challenge is still persisting. No African government, uh, was happy to hear Orazio this morning, no African government spends more than 1% on GDP, of their GDP on research. So this is the context in which AIMS uh, emerged, and the context in which AIMS and our key partners, uh, most of them Canadian universities, are working. Another challenge, uh, which is really um, uh, uh, one that is a, appeals to all government leaders in Africa and academics and universities, 11 million of young people in Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa enter the job market each year. So here's the approach that we're, we're trying, we've been trying to implement over the past 14 years. It's an approach which en encompasses six components. AIMS is all about enabling young African scientific talents to use their science skills to solve problems. Problems in health industry sector, problems in finance, in, te in uh, techn information technology, epidemiology, energy. So the first pillar of AIMS is our postgraduate training. The, the, the focus, we put the emphasis on problem solving, independent thinking. Uh, it's not about the students going into a classroom, sitting down and just absorb whatever the, uh, the lecturer is saying. The second uh, pillar of our approach, which we have been growing with research institutions with like IDRC, like the Robert Bosch Foundation, is to ensure that students, AIMS graduate, tackle research which directly speak uh, to the critical development problems that Africa is facing in the field of energy, in the field of uh, epidemiological modeling, in the field of um, uh, information technology. We've been growing that uh, component of our model, which is quite new, but we hope to continue to grow it up to a certain point. There's one which ties into this research component, which we're calling the Quantum Leap Africa. As you all are aware, Africa has missed uh, two rendezvous in terms of information technology. Uh, the two rendezvous, the first one was the analog uh, era. We miss the analog era. We miss the digital era. We do not want to miss the quantum revolution. Actually, because of the young demographic uh, capacity uh, that Africa offers, we want to be able to position the continent and to leapfrog uh, quantum science and technology. We have just signed a partnership agreement with the Rwandan government to set up the very first research center in quantum science and technology on the African soil. It's going to grow in three phases. Number one, the first phase will be to tackle critical development problems by investing more in training young people in data analytics. The second phase will be smart science uh, design and systems. And then the third phase of that uh, Quantum Leap Africa is the, um, the quantum science and te quantum te technologies. The, ad the fourth component of this approach to help advance the SDGs is the one that seeks to bridge the gap between uh, tertiary education institutions, university, uh, science, and industry. We want to be able 
to train well-rounded scientists. We want mathematical scientists at Ames, which will be, who will be immediately employable if they decide not to go into academia and go into the private sector. So we are also investing in that, and we're working with MasterCard on a pilot project. A fifth pillar of this approach, which is equally important, if we sit here talking about how higher education can help advance SDGs, and we don't think about how to affect what happened prior to higher education, we will miss the point in this room. It's extremely important that we pay attention to the products we're getting from high school. This is something Ames has been, um, that Ames has been implementing. We are running an award-winning teacher training program in math and science. We've started in Cameroon. We have been reaching 1.7 million students and will continue to grow on that front. And the last one, which I would like to show you here, at about a month ago, we all gathered in Senegal. Some of our partners here were there. We hosted and organized the very first global forum for science uh, to, to take place on the African soil. We had uh, uh, 1,000 participants uh, from over 100 countries. Just because at Ames, we said the approach will be, there will be a missing link in the approach. If you train young African scientists, you make them problem solvers, they are innovators, but at the end of the day, science is global. There's no such things as African science, European science, American science. At Ames, we talk about science, period. So we all know that major discoveries, technical advances, all have been the results of collaborations. But when it comes to the African context, collaboration is difficult for our young scientists. First of all, they may be doing wonders, but when it comes time for them to go to Europe, to Washington, to France, Paris, London, to showcase what they're doing, they're confronted with one obstacle, getting a visa. So how would you be able to learn with your peer if by the time young African under the age of 42 are invited to go to Paris, a Japanese gets there, he doesn't have to worry about visa, while a young scientist female from Africa or Somalia or whatever, Togo, would struggle to get the visa. By the time she gets there, she's stressed out. So we want to provide that global forum to young Africans, which is an important link uh, in, the, in the approach we're implementing. And we want to bring the whole global scientific community to Africa to meet, to interact with them. It's a platform that seeks to bridge, to, to enable collaboration among young African scientists and the rest of the world. So that's the synthesis of the approach we've been following, implementing over the past uh, 14 years. There you see some of the faces of the young Next Einstein Fellows who were in Dakar recently. Uh, but I'd like to conclude on this and say that I'm happy to take questions and to further discuss some of the uh, statement or claims that I've made during this presentation. But I want to say that what we're doing at Ames, basically, we're seeking ways in which we can create the 21st century university. We're claiming that. One that has an integrated approach to societal challenges and issues. And 21st century university, not just for Africa, not just for the global south, but for, for the global north. And second, a new approach to advancing SDGs, which is not integrated, uh, might be missing something, and SDGs may not happen if further investment in STEM education and research is not taken seriously. And lastly, I'd like to be a little bit provocative, David, and say that I hope uh, and I'm talking to the organizers of this conference, that the smart global development, uh, we should be very careful that it is not designed, the agenda is not designed just by the global north. We need a stronger implication of the global south. And quite frankly, to the organizers, the representation from the global south is not satisfactory to me in this room. 
let us not fall back into the trap of the World Bank and the Bretton Woods Institution. It has to be include, it has to include the global south thoroughly in the way we move forward with this smart development uh, uh, process and thinking. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Well, I think we know who's hosting the next Smart Global Development Conference. Uh, uh, our, our next presenter, uh, we owe a um, uh, strong uh, debt of gratitude to for two reasons. One, of course, she brings the, the great perspective of uh, USAID to this, uh, to this panel. But uh, even more importantly, she has, uh, was a, a last-minute recruit to the panel uh, through a variety of circumstances. We lost a couple of our, our panelists, so we're very grateful to uh, Barbara Schneeman, who's the uh, Higher Education uh, Coordinator for USAID. Uh, to agree to join us, so thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And um, what great presentations. I, I, I feel um, I'm, I, I hope what I have to contribute is equally as useful. Thank you. Um, I, I, I do, I'm glad I had the opportunity to participate in this panel. It wasn't planned, and so I, I hope I was able to put together something that will make a contribution to the, the discussions. Um, but it did give me more of an opportunity to talk about how USAID is tackling some of the issues that we hear over and over again in the, the discussions. And one of the reasons I was particularly interested in coming to this conference is because of that broad look to smart development that pulls in higher education, but also the Aga Khan Foundation has been one of the great partners with USAID. There are several programs that we have partnered with them, and they're truly valued as one of our partners. So um, our, I, I did have a PowerPoint. I, too, have my academic roots very deep, and so speaking without slides gives me the jitters. <laughs> Are the, Ten minutes left. <laughs> do we have the do we, slides? Do we have the slides? I can... I'm, I'm getting this uncomfortable feeling. A lot of people are looking at each other questioningly, but nobody's saying yes, they do. Ah, uh, okay. Well, let me move forward then. <laughs> so, just for reference, USAID is the lead government agency in international development. USAID was actually created in 1961, but it reflects a long-term commitment of the U.S. government to international development. Um, Probably one of the signature programs that many people are familiar with is the Marshall Plan following World War II, and that is a, an important part of our legacy. Throughout its history, USAID has had very strong partnerships through higher education. And part of what I've learned, I've been at the agency for one year, certainly I have learned that that kind of goes up and down, it's visible, not so visible, but it's always been there as part of the, the programming. The, the mission of USAID is we partner to end extreme poverty and promote resilient democratic societies while advancing our security and prosperity. And, and it's always important for me to say that mission. Um, it was explained to me, the short version is, you're trying to work yourself out of a job, is what you really want to do in, in development. Um, but when we think of that mission, and this, I'm sorry, we don't have a slide for this. The, the next slide was going to show you all of the program areas that USAID works in food security, human rights and governance, economic growth and trade, education, environment and global climate change, gender equality, women empowerment, global health, water and sanitation, humanitarian assistance, technology and, and innovation. And it's important to look at that list because I'm sure everyone in this room can figure out a role for higher education in each of those areas. Sometimes the role is very direct, it, it creates the infrastructure to move those programs forward. Sometimes it's indirect, that in order to be successful in those areas, 
We need a professional workforce. That's a role for higher education. We need the research that allows us to develop the evidence that we want for evidence-based decision-making. Um, I tell my colleagues back at the agency, every time you tell me we should be doing evidence-based decision-making, you're making a case for higher education. That's something that, that um, is very key to, to who they are. The next slide was going to show you where we work, just to give you a map of the places. And I thought it was important in the context of this conference to highlight where we work simply from the view that so much of what we do is not in Washington, D.C. It is out in the field. And much of the decision making at USAID is done in the field. And it's done in conjunction with the host country. So we have certain areas that are important to us to meet our mission, but that's a negotiation then with the host country to make sure that we're meeting their priorities as well. And one of the things that I've been told repeatedly that while a host country may identify some of those program areas I just highlighted, they don't always identify higher education as their priority. And, and I think that's important for us to, to think about in terms of we want the outcome, we want the food security, we want the environmental issues, but we're not necessarily recognizing the vehicle that will help us get there. And it's not that higher education is the only vehicle, but it's certainly a major vehicle and it, it needs gas in its engine to, to do it. Um, in 2009, um, USAID began a process to develop an education strategy, and as a part of that, it had a report done for it to look at what are some of the challenges, where are some of the opportunities with education, education writ broad, not just higher education. And I thought it would be worthwhile to just highlight some of the challenges that came out of that report. It's a publicly available report. It's called Pathway to Learning in the 21st Century. And so when we think about ways to strengthen higher education, I think it's important to recognize what are the challenges we're also trying to address. And the first one, no surprise, rising costs that um, when we look at some of the issues around massification of higher education, as we increase the number of students, are we increasing the resources that go into educating those students? Um, and we can't do that without rising costs for higher education. Um, we've talked about the, the youth demographic, demographic um, around the world, that increases demand. And I think we do recognize it is a strain on country resources. We've heard the statistics of how much certain countries put into higher education. But we also have to recognize in many countries it's a new demand on resources. So it does take some planning to think about how do we meet that, that new demand. The second area that they highlight as a challenge are the access issues. And again, we've heard about that. Um, I categorize them as access issues deal with location within a country, urban populations versus rural populations, income status. Um, we've heard repeatedly people focus on the idea of higher education is for the elite. That is an issue we need to confront directly. What happens in a country where we don't have that opportunity for growth of, of wealth, that we can be critical of the elite, and yet they also make a contribution um, in the, the population. And of course, access for the underserved groups. Um, women, disadvantaged populations, disabled populations, all of those groups that have been underserved by higher education. Um, third area, third challenge was quality and relevance. And there were three factors that I highlight under the quality and, and relevance. The, 
do we have an international standard for what we mean by quality? Um, the faculty development aspect, in some cases it's building the qualifications of the faculty, but otherwise it's ongoing development of faculty so that they continue to grow. And then institutional policies, the degree to which um, policies allow for autonomy and accountability, collaboration, and also the competition that drives many of us forward. Um, one of the former chancellors at UC Davis used to always talk about the tensions that you create in institutions. Those tensions can be healthy, where they drive you forward, or they can be unhealthy in which, when they become non-productive. And then quality assurance um, in any institution. <coughs> The fourth challenge that I think is particularly relevant is harnessing higher education for development. That higher education needs to be an integral part of any country's development strategy. And um, we, we talk quite a bit about the knowledge economy. Higher education is the source of that, that knowledge, the knowledge for programs. Um, the adapting technology, making it work within particular contexts, and also the communication that's required, that rapid communication is now a critical part of economy. And the, the fifth challenge area that they identified is the presence of fragile states. And I think we heard yesterday that one of the challenges with fragile states is that faculty are forced to flee. Um, students, our youth, lose opportunity. And that's a reality in the world that we live in today and we have to think about how we address those, those challenges. So, um, it's hard talking without my slides. I keep waiting for the next one to come up. I guess I don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready to push the button no matter what, but if I push it, it just tells me I have 10 minutes left, so. <laughs> <laughs> so how we work at USAID, and one of the areas I, I was so glad that I have the opportunity to highlight because it's something I've heard so much in this conference, and that's the concept of local systems and partnerships. Um, in April 2014, USAID published a document, Local Systems, a Framework for Supporting Sustained Development. And it outlines 10 principles for local systems. One way of thinking about it is that whole notion of flipping the paradigm. We're used to the idea of the developed country having resources that it then deploys in a developing country with the idea of achieving some aim. If we flip the paradigm, then we say, how do we get resources to the host country and let them demand the services that they feel are most relevant to what they're trying to achieve? I think one of the closest places I've seen it um, in the limited time at, I've been at USAID is in one of our higher education solution network um, networks. And that's the one that was established by Makere University in Uganda and it collaborates with other African countries. That particular network is um, Resilient Africa Network. And so it's looking at resilience in the, in the face of shocks and stresses that happen within the system. And so the resources are with McCary, and they make the decision of who they want to bring in to help them build their program and design their, their innovations in terms of how they approach it. So it's, again, it's flipping the paradigm so that when we talk about local solutions and local systems, we're making sure that the driver comes from that local level. Um, I, I'll... Oh, we have my slides. <laughs> so um, this, this is the publication, the local systems publication that's on our, our website. So when we think about the value that higher education brings to development, you know, I, I created this slide originally to talk to universities in the U.S., but to me, it also captures what we want higher education in developing countries to bring to that country's own development. 
that they are the source of science, technology, and innovation. They lead in terms of education and training. Um, they develop long-term relationships. They, um, they have the ability to leverage funds and to build public-private partnerships, so they build that relevance in the local context. And they, they are the masters in terms of program implementation in that, that local context. So I want to finish by talking about some priorities that I see emerging in the context of, of USAID and priorities relative to higher education. And within our agency, there will always be priorities relative to those programmatic areas, um, food security, um, health, teacher training, economics, science and technology, environment, climate change. What I have been encouraging people to do in those programs is as they develop the program to ask the question, what are the knowledge and skills that are needed for your development outcome to be sustainable? Because that's what we need to figure out. How do we bring that to the country? Not just our expertise, but we have to make sure that when we're gone, the knowledge and skills and the ability to sustain that knowledge and skills remains in that country. Um, certainly, the equitable access for underserved and disadvantaged populations is a high priority for USAID and cuts across all of our programming areas. Um, one of the tools that USAID has developed is for gender assessment because that has to be a part of all of our programming at, at USAID. We also do um, cross-program assessment for climate change. So we've developed tools so that implementers can in fact do those assessments. It's not just the little paragraph that says women will be included. It, the assessment has to be a part of it. Um, if you look at our scholarship programs, they are designed around improving access and making sure we have equitable access for women for, and for other disadvantaged groups, in, including disabled groups. Um, and I would just point out one of the White House initiatives is Let Girls Learn. The other part of equitable access that I think it's important to keep in mind, one of the um, groups within USAID is ASHA, American Schools and Hospitals Abroad, which invests in infrastructure. It's kind of a unique little beast in that it, it, it only invests in infrastructure. But often that's the, the key to helping us get to equitable access. It may be that dormitory so that women have a safe place so they can go to the university. It may be the, the kind of services that are needed for disadvantaged students so they can be engaged in the institution. So it, it becomes an, an important piece. And also the secondary education would be another area where we'd have to look at that to think about equitable access. The next area is quality and relevance, as is one of the, the challenges. We do have a tool that's ava available for hu evaluating human and, um, human and institutional capacity development, and, and we have projects that, that are based on that. Um, I would highlight one of our programs called PEER, Partnerships for Enhanced Engagement and Research. PEER invests in PIs, principal investigators, in the developing country. They're the ones who write the grant, they submit the grant, they're then partnered with a US scientist who has funding from one of our federal science funding agencies. But the whole goal is to build that research expertise within the, the PI in the developing country. And as a part of doing that, because it's U.S. taxpayer dollar, we have to also look at the ability of their institution to manage the funds and do some capacity development around that fund management, grant management, so the, the development goes broader than just the research. Um, and once again, sometimes it's facilities that will help us in that quality and relevance. I just recently learned about the Himalayan um, Cataract Project, just an amazing project where ASHA provided facilities, but they now have expanded to 
training of so many staff that they can do cataract surgery at a rate and a quality that cannot be matched in the U.S. And it, it's just very moving to see what it means to a person who's lost their sight to regain it. I have this image of this little man just dancing. <laughs> he was so excited. And then the, the final area is the public service and community engagement of higher education. And again, this is an area near and dear to my heart because of my experience in the land-grant university where higher education becomes relevant to every person in the community, not because they got a degree, because it is addressing the issues in, in their community. Um, Feed the Future, our, it's a presidential initiative around food security, provides an excellent example where we partner through our U.S. institutions with institutions worldwide on food security issues but at the end of the day, if the innovations don't reach the farmer level and what happens in the field and in the chain, the food chain, it doesn't matter. So we have to have that outreach as a critical part of it. Um, I, I would just end by commenting that we are in the process now of revising our education strategy, an important issue. Um, will be how we integrate higher education into that strategy. So I, I hope you'll all take a look at that when it comes out later this year. Great, thanks. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Just before I open up for questions, I am checking. We have 15 minutes left. I think we have more. Right? Two, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, in that case, we have 15 minutes left, uh, and I see some hands up already, so we'll start with the gentleman right here, and again, if you could uh, use the microphone and the, the red, uh, the right button. I think I've got it. Uh, hi, I'm Robin Fark, we're a former president of Carleton and uh, vice chair of the board of directors for Academics Without Borders. And I have a question for Thierry. Uh, I think you said that you're in the process of setting up Africa's first quantum science center in Rwanda. Can you tell us how that initiative is linked to the new University of Rwanda or any other higher education institution in that country? Shall, we, nope. shall I go now? Yeah, yeah. Um, the way, first of all, the way AIMS functions, we do not affiliate to national universities. We are autonomous, but we work in um, a strong partnership with local national higher education institutions. So in Rwanda, we are going to be partnering with the University of Rwanda and some other uh, higher education institutions initiatives. Uh, we want to keep the, our autonomy in that we want an agile governance structure. We don't want the type of governance structure that you have in some universities or most universities, be it in the global south and global north, where to change a comma in the curriculum, it might take two years. We want to be proactive. So how the initiative came about, it came about uh, looking at how we can continue to grow our research portfolio with our partners by proactively position Africa to leapfrog in information technology. If you recall what I just said, uh, that uh, we are consumers. We are consuming uh, whatever the Global North has developed. While we have talents, we had young people who are very interested, keen on embarking in research in quantum science. So we want to make, make it possible for them uh, to, while staying in Africa, to be able to access uh, those, those uh, high-end science. The idea behind it is also to say that we do not want to confine Africa to only need-based sciences. We want curiosity-driven sciences as well. So we want to be, to want young Africans to, hunt, to be able to do research in space science. While there's still people struggling to get food, put food on the table for their family. 
Because if we confine Africa to need-based science, in three decades, five decades from now, you and I will be sitting here saying, gosh, this continent is lagging behind. So we want to be able to embrace the full spectrum of science, fundamental research, applied research, curiosity-driven, and so that's the rationale behind the initiative. Now, we cannot do this all by ourselves. Obviously, you can tell that behind this initiative, we'll have the Institute of Quantum Computing, who, is going to be, who we are going to partner with in Waterloo, Perimeter Institute, most of the Canadian universities here will work on partnership from around the globe. So we've signed the agreement with the government of Rwanda. Uh, and as some of you might be aware, uh, this is one of the very few countries in Africa which is doing, um, uh, making a, a great progress in the sector of information technology. They're trying their very best, looking at how far they've come. A couple of decades ago, this country, there was no state there. But they're, they're kind of making tremendous progress in that field. We, feel, we felt that the, the environment is conducive for us to have that quantum leap Africa in, in Rwanda. Please. I, I, I do want to comment on, um, I, I think you're right on in terms of you need to tackle at the same time. If you look at what we did where we put all of our emphasis on basic education, without having the inclusion of higher education as Absolutely. well, we, we can wind up where you, we can't develop a country with high school graduates. I mean, we, we need that full spectrum. And so I think you're right on the research side that we, we can't just silo that you get to do this kind of research to really move forward. It's that investment and recognizing the whole picture that we're trying to accomplish. Yeah, I think the Ames Initiative is a terrific initiative, and it's quite obvious uh, that there are great discoveries to be made by researchers in the Global South. Uh, we are missing out on enormous talents and brain power. But I want to add to something that you said. Uh, what we have to do is to realize that most of the students in the Global South are not going to be educated at Ames style institutes. They're going to be educated at large, mostly public institutions that are terribly underfunded. So if we want a constituent of development, what we have to do is to concentrate part of the resources on these institutions so that they can educate the experts and professionals needed for development. And this is a very long, long, difficult project to do. So that's just what I wanted to add here to, to make sure that we don't lose sight of that. I saw another hand. Yeah. <clears throat> I wondered if I could extend the argument about the, um, the challenges of focusing on one aspect we talked about basic education, you focus on that, you miss opportunities elsewhere. And I'm wondering if the same argument holds true for the role of the private sector, because I'll go back to the Caribbean again. We spent a lot of time, you know, a lot of international organizations, primary education, enrollment rates have increased. People still leave because there isn't a functional public sector, a private sector, excuse me. So what is the role of the higher education in making sure that you're connected in some form or fashion to the private sector because obviously, you know, it's a sort of a, it's a, a cyclical issue, right? That you can't work on one stream or one aspect of these issues without bringing the others around. So what's the role of the higher education in including the private sector in these discussions? Can I come in? Sure. I, well, you raise an excellent point, and in, at least in my agency, the private sector is very much a part of where we want to see developments happen. And um, one of the, USAID has really been experimenting with what they're calling flexible funding mechanisms. It's just new ways to think about how we garner the funding for development. Because if you, if you look at dollars toward development, donor 
com governments are the small players now. It's the large foundations, but we have leverage power, so we, we still have a ticket in the, in the game. Um, one of the mechanisms that we've been using is called a GDA, a Global Development Alliance, where the whole intent is to bring together private sector funding, government priorities, USAID investment, to, to move forward in a project. And one GDA that comes to mind is one in Vietnam that I'm familiar with, where the, the focus for the government was to improve engineering. And it needed to improve engineering because it was dealing with some of the major companies, Intel being one, where they were being told, we'd love to build a plant here, but we, don't, we can't hire people. We'd have to be bringing people here. And so the focus in that case was to build the engineering curriculum. And um, through this GDA mechanism where Intel, the government, USAID, and higher education, Arizona State, became a partner, that's what they've been doing. Um, to the point that programs are now becoming accredited within Vietnam. They are producing the engineers. More companies are buying in to support the program. So it's, it's now taking on a life of itself. So you're exactly right. The private sector has to be a, a player in all of this. And we have to find the ways to do that. Yeah. I think your, quick, yeah. sorry. No, go ahead. your question is relevant. and. Uh, this is something we're dealing with every day. That's where our programs, under our approach, the AIMS Industry Initiative fits in. Uh, a few years ago, traveling across Africa and meeting with business leaders in South Africa, in Ghana, Senegal, Ethiopia, you hear many business leaders saying, I have vacancies. Uh, I need students. Some of them did recruit students from the Faculty of Science, mathematician, physicists. But the main complaint that you hear from them is that, but these young students, they, they're bright, they're smart, but they're not employable. I can't employ them. They've got a master's degree in math, a master's degree in physics, but some of them have never used a, a, a computer. So some of the soft skills, how do you carry your body in a workplace? Simple as that. So from that point, we designed uh, the AIMS Industry Initiative in partnership with the IDLC, with MasterCard, and with University of Ottawa, saying, if you are a young graduate and you are in our course, master's degree in mathematical sciences, you're not interested in moving into academia right away, and you're interested in going into business, you've got an opportunity at AIMS today to take a co-op master's degree. And uh, Canada has um, worldwide uh, renowned expertise in that. And Canada is the, the universe, Canadian universities are universities we're working with. So we engage business leaders at three levels, at governance level, academic level, and at the end of the pipeline where we give young people opportunities to get a job. At governance level, we are developing a process of inclusion of business leaders into our governance, into our board of direct, uh, directors. Uh, uh, in Senegal, the chair of the board was the head of Sunatel Orange, uh, biggest telecom company. And uh, the head of uh, the Chamber of Commerce in Senegal is also a member of the board. Those people have been helping us a lot. They will attend our academic and scientific council meeting and share with us what they want, where the private sector is headed in a few years. And then lastly, internship, but also entrepreneurship. It's still at infant stage, but we don't want young people, young Africans, they're very entrepreneur. We don't want them just to wait for someone to provide them with a job. We want to also explore that entrepreneurial opportunities. Yeah, uh, it's a central question. Uh, and. I what we have here is somebody who's heading uh, institutions in the Global South where those institutions can take these kinds of initiatives. Now, our NGO is not an institution in the Global South, so we look to those institutions themselves to make decisions 
about bringing in the private sector and to ask for assistance if they need it in doing that kind of thing. So I think it's an important question, but it's up to the institutions themselves or the ministries of higher education or education to look to these sorts of things and say, yes, that's the way we'd like to go. And then if they need assistance, they could come to an organization like ours. If, uh, just a brief add on, uh, because you've raised a good point that we assume everyone approaches public private partnerships the same way we do. And often there can be government policies that discourage that kind of relationship. Um, those policies need to be addressed, certainly the ethics and the infrastructure that surrounds how do you create effective public-private partnerships is a part of the capacity development that may be needed to do that effectively. So that's another piece of the puzzle. I'm afraid we've run out of time uh, because we need to have a small break before you go into your uh, next sessions. And I think we have some... Uh, housekeeping announcements to make. I'll just uh, thank on your behalf our uh, panelists, three very different perspectives, um, but three great perspectives. Thank you very much, and thank you very much. Thank you.